<laughs> Shadow's basically running this argument that says um, anyone could just define category X as something else, and then and then and then the argument wouldn't follow as a modus ponens because it wouldn't be the case. You know, if I if I define category X as like the set of objects that are purple, <laughs> then it wouldn't follow. Um, like the the material conditional in P one wouldn't be true. So that's that's the substantial rejection they're going for now. Is basically just objecting to the math, the, the homework, right? They're just saying like, I don't want to do this. Did you end up uh, watching their video? Um, I watched like twenty five minutes. I didn't watch the whole thing. I felt uh, like it took them a really long time to get to the point. It did. They, they by nine minutes in, they haven't even started on the formal argument, and then yeah. they spend like a solid like now they're like ten minutes, just like talking about the identity of, identity of indiscernibles, and the law of identity in just this completely incorrect way. Um, this is this is the most recent page, so you can go read through the whack rejecting P two as false argument, which. Is probably my favorite. P two takes a rather unusual form of being a category definition rather than a substantive claim, which makes it functionally impossible to refute. What? <laughs> Why are they using such abstruse language? Somebody could attempt to deny the name for that category on the basis that category X means something else or has another definition. <laughs> yeah. but that's not an essential part of the argument. So. Category Z, Y, A, B would all be acceptable if what the argument actually means is not literal category X. Yeah, it doesn't, but any given con conceivable category of ideas labeled arbitrarily for the purpose of this discussion, then there are seemingly infinite number of potential conceptual categories and respective names for those categories. As long as the category, category can exist, that's what's needed. Yeah, right. To deny that there is any category available to classify these views would be a very bizarre claim as though all possible categories are already named, filled, and accounted for. Such a claim would likely run afoul of Gödel's incompleteness. What, what does that have to do with this? Yeah, that, to an impossible that, that one was hilarious to me. Like, I, I don't actually know where that came from. It just seems so out of left field. I don't think that actually followed. However, what isn't a far-fetched refutation is that P2 isn't substantive, and it could, and perhaps should, just be a definition for a term in P1. What, what was the whole point of this paragraph? All, all that it says is that P2 is kind of obvious. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's, that's what to ask yourself. And I, that's what we said. It was just like, what, what does he think he's saying? Yeah, I mean, I don't understand why he even wrote that. And what, yeah. what the fuck does Godel's incompleteness yeah, have to do? Nothing, literally nothing. Like, that, that mm -hmm. isn't at all the case, right? It's not. It's, this like, is like this is like Jordan Peterson level invocation of Gödel's incompleteness. What, what does math have to do with? <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, well, Isaac wants me to read the um, the next part. Yeah. The one. The one below is the. Uh... Yeah, because because it's trivial apparently. Okay. The refutation that P two isn't substantive and that it could and perhaps should just be a definition of a term in P one or category X, stated more clearly there as what it represents. This is so poorly written. Suggests that the argument may not be much of an argument at all. In other words, the argument could reduce to P1 for any given category of views that contain only views that affirm a given human is reducible to a given human, animal via trait switching or retaining moral value. All views in that category can only deny the given animal has moral value on pain of P not P. Conclusion, therefore all views in such a category, the ones contain, the one contains only views that affirm a given human is reducible to a given Animal, a given human animal via trait switching while retaining moral value can only deny the given animal has moral value on pain given P not P. This would be question begging and might not be very persuasive, or in the very least doesn't make a very good argument for, or no, it doesn't have P2. How does that work? Labeling and extorting the definition of category X to P2 in this case. I'm not even understanding this. <laughs> This is so just like what you remember um, in the in the philosophical. Okay, in, 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 to put it to, to put it short, um, 
when I got Shadow to defend this view yesterday in their server, I got Shadow to admit that Modus Ponens is useless. Like he just doesn't think that it offers any. <laughs> it just doesn't offer any value at all. In well, his uh... words, his words, we should just use natural language and just turn every Modus Ponens into a sentence, and that Modus Ponens is just a useless construct. Well, I know there are people who do deny. There are philosophers who do deny Modus Ponens, but that doesn't sound doesn't sound like he has some kind of objection to it. That just sounds silly. Second premise is unnecessary given the law of identity. We'll see. What's this trying to say? Um, <laughs> you know, in the perspective, in the video that they made, they criticized NTT because of its use of uh, philosophical nomenclature, right? And then they recommended the philosophical vegan wiki, but this uses lots of nomenclature and complicated and like abstruse yeah. language. Read the part about. God is God. If God is God, then God exists. God is God, therefore God exists. Oh, note how the second premise is unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's not unnecessary. It doesn't say that God is in fact God. It, it's just an if statement. It wasn't unnecessary. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it would just be an if this, then this. That doesn't prove anything. It would just be making an if statement. Yeah, the, and the law of identity they, doesn't prove ontological existence. Like, if, if it's unicorns just... are unicorns, then unicorns exist. Like, that, that, this is just such a, like, basic, like, misuse of the law of identity. It's just fucking retarded. Like, what I have no clue what identity, they're trying to do. What does it even have to do with that? Right, this is, this is like, this is, like, even lower than, like, Anselm-level, like, ontological argument bullshit. Just so. I don't understand why they're trying to say that P2 is dispensable, but obviously it isn't. If there was no P2, then you would just have an if claim, and then you would have what followed from the if <laughs> claim. Well, look, right, because their their argument is just that um, like those things are already included in the definition, um, and so the 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 if claim is just like describing the definition. And so you don't actually need to assert something about like the object, right? Like it's just they're just undermining the concept of modus ponens. Yeah, I mean, I just this really just baffles me. Right. <laughs> Was this actually written by Philo? This page. Yeah, this this page it... this page is by Philo. Yeah. This guy is a real bonehead. Yeah, it is. Like, like he um, can't write, he can't argue, he can't well, make like himself it, clear. Right, like it's got it's gotten to the point now where like his entire like um like crowd of people now have just thrown deduction out the window. Like, because basically, like what I did is I was in there just listening to them talk about like philosophy of mind stuff because they were talking about like phenomenology. And how that shows that like veganism is wrong or something like that. It was kind of interesting. And then I started talking about like this stuff, and <laughs> they they just made the claim like you know, you know Isaac's argument is deductively valid, but it's not doing anything useful. And so I asked like, what, what do you mean by useful? And their claim was just that um, any deductive argument where it's just definitional um, is it's going to be the case that it's just not useful. And so I, I asked them to give me a deductive argument that that wouldn't apply to. And then they said, <laughs> they said that uh, if Socrates is a man, um, then Socrates is mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. <laughs> and it's just like, well, <laughs> it doesn't actually work out because like it's not included in the definition of man that they're mortal. Or if it is, then it's, this is just going to be like a case that this just is going to apply to your argument. And then they made like the claim that it's a type of definition where the definition is based on pre previous experiences. And then I asked them what the dif difference is between a deductive argument based on pre uh, previous experiences and an inductive argument. And after sitting there for like five minutes, there they just sort of like came to the conclusion that actually it just turns out modus ponens is useless. And that's that's where they're at now. Jesus. And then and then um, and then. Their their 
resident co uh, continental PhD came in to tell me that logic is found inductively, um, but somehow it becomes deductive and then it goes back to being inductive and it just like, it's a fluctuating state of inductive deductive and then some weird shit about synthetic a priori and uh, analytic a priori and a posteriori mm -hmm. and just like invoked like Kant like 20 times and I just stopped listening at some point. Yeah, well, arguing against modus ponens doesn't seem like a uh, good strategy. Oh, for... yeah. Well, they said, like Shadow literally told me, like, mo all modus ponens can be reduced to a natural language sentence, and so we should just do that because otherwise it's useless. And I told him, like, I just disagree with that. Like, there's usages to deductive arguments. And he said, no, you should go read a book. And he got really upset because my response was, well, what book would you suggest? And he just started yelling at me. <laughs> and like, they, they, just, they just started like getting angry because I just started asking them, like, well, like, what book should I go research to like agree with you? I was like, I'll bite the bullet. Like, mate, I, I guess like I should just like, I should be in this logical system because apparently this is the useful one, the one that you guys have access to. It's like the it's like the opposite of like Darth, right? Because Darth tries to undermine induction, but these guys these guys are straight up like undermining <laughs> deduction, which is just so crazy. We should really get them to debate each other, and they should see which one is more useless: induction or deduction. Yeah, well, like it could be interesting to um. The thing is, is that it's not really going to be interesting if the, if the whole thing just comes down to, well, modus ponens doesn't work, right? Because that would just knock out every single modus ponens argument. So well, I mean, like, it's, it's not a specific like, objection to NTT. Well, that's that's what I was asking them too. Is like, well, look, like if I bite the bullet on what you guys are saying, like, like what what turns on that? Like, even if I say, like, you know all modus ponens are begging the question, you know, what does that result in? It doesn't actually change anything about NTT. NTT is still true. So like, I don't, I don't understand like what the objection is. They had to, they'd have to show that it's like a formal fallacy and they're incapable of doing that. They all agree that it's a valid argument and it's a sound argument. It's just to them, it's just psychologically true. So it's useless. Yeah, I, just, I just don't know what to say about this. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've had a few other funny moments in that server, like getting them to agree that definitions have to include uh, every relevant characteristic of an object or concept. So, like the definition of like Socrates would have to include like his feeding time, his sleep schedule, <laughs> his clothing, his like geographical location. Um, because I was telling them that, like, basically saying, like, Socrates as a man is, an, like, an intentional definition. It's just an incomplete definition. And so a complete definition would include all of the characteristics, but that would just be a definition that has more degrees of truth than saying, like, Socrates is a man. And they told me that the only definitions that exist are complete definitions. And then right. I started running a sororities on them, where, like, something goes from being a non-definition to being a definition, and at some point they just threw up their arms and said, you know, everything has to include everything. <laughs> so, like, to define Socrates, I basically need to describe the causal history of every single quark. Yeah, ever, like, exactly, right. With Socrates. Because they, because like they just they bit the bullet on the sororities between like Socrates is a man not being definitional, and Socrates is, and then the complete set of all things true of Socrates being the definition. They couldn't elucidate to me what would and wouldn't be a definition there, except to just say it's a binary state where we achieve definitionhood at having the list of all things true of an object or concept. So I guess we uh, have a lot less definitions than we think we do. Oh yeah, these oh, yeah these guys <laughs> these guys have solved like the all problems of linguistics just by like being in their Discord for a couple of weeks. Um. 
Farlow's analogy breaker on question begging mode as ponens versus non question begging. If God is God, then God exists. God is God, therefore God exists. Well, that wouldn't be it would be a weird argument, but it wouldn't be like question begging. Not how the second premise is unnecessary. No, it's not unnecessary. So yeah, they're trying to say that it's unnecessary again, that doesn't make any sense. This is distinct from more substantive uses such as if dogs are mammals, then dogs drink milk, dogs are mammals, then dogs drink milk. You may say that being a mammal is part of the definition of a dog, but it is not only that, being a mammal is also a substantive claim that could conceivably be argued. It would seem odd to argue that dogs are not mammals, given how common knowledge that claim is, but it is conceivable that lacking the relevant empirical information, it could be in question. I mean, what the... What's he trying to say here again? I'm just not... I'm just not seeing it. He's, he's trying to say that NTT is like the first argument, and it's weird for some reason, and that it should be like the second argument, but it's not really, is it? I mean, it's 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 not just saying if God is God, then God exists. Um, yeah, and this is so confusing to you. You understand what he's trying to say here, bro? No, no, I don't. Other, other than just that, they think, um, like, I, I, all I take him to be saying is just that, like, definitions as a premise um, mean that something is question begging, um, <laughs> but some definitions are based a posteriori, and so we could actually um, argue about them. That's all, like, all he's saying to me. That's, that's what they said he's saying. They would say that like a, a priori um, definitions are ones we would just be making question begging arguments about, and a posteriori definitions are ones that we would be making actual useful modus ponens about. <laughs> and that word useful, that's kind of strange. Like, what do they mean by useful? Do they mean useful in a, in a debate, like for convincing somebody? And, and, because if that's... Useful, the argument useful informatively, right? Well, I mean, even an, an a priori argument can be useful informatively if you've just never thought about that thing before. Right. Well, exactly right. Like, if an object is a triangle, then it has three sides. This object is a triangle. Therefore, right, it has three sides. Well, when I didn't still... know what a triangle was, it was useful for me to know that. Right. It's still, it's still, like, it's... It's the most basic concept I could come up with that is like, to me, like a synthetic a priori, right? Where it's just giving me some information from the definition of like an analytic thing, like trying. Philo says that manness isn't contained in Socrates, but that God exists is contained in God is God, therefore it's question begging. Well, you know, obviously he's wrong about that, right? Manness is contained in Socrates. You couldn't have Socrates be a sentient cloud of gas. Um, and then, <laughs> therefore, it's question begging. Like that's not what makes an argument question begging, is it? So, no. this is just you know, it's just so silly. Do you think they just Wikipedia warriored on question begging? Um, and even if it were the case, right, that it's a true antecedent, then you could still have a false material conditional. So, for example, um, if God is God, then God exists is a false. Um, material conditional. I like I don't what is like Philo's background? Is he just like a Wikipedia warrior or does he like actually have like an academic background? I've never like really understood what his sure. contribution to the community Well he just runs a defunct uh, wiki basically. <laughs> I see. He has a YouTube channel that he's never uploaded to. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, we may as well shut down the server now. Actually, what did, what, did, what did you think ends up of uh, perspective philosophy asserting that moral intuitionism is, <laughs> is just 
us not understanding why <laughs> we make moral claims. It's just the fact that we intuit them and like they just happen like arbitrarily out of nowhere in almost like a fatalistic. Yeah, that's uh, a weird way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what's weird is I've, I, I asked him like where he got like his definition of intuitionism from. And he's like a Humerian intuitionist, but he takes intuitionism to mean like we just intuit moral facts and we don't understand like the antecedent causes to them. It's just like moral value of animals is just this like thing that we intuitively just perceive, right? It's just like to him, all it is is just like there, there'd be like a value number that like floats above animals, basically. And like we wouldn't understand why a cow has like a value of like fifty, and why a human has like a value of like two hundred. It's just like it's just a number that's just arbitrarily and particularly there. Hmm, sounds strange. Doesn't um he have like a master's degree of some? Yeah, but as far as I understand it, um, it's not in meta ethics or logic, or even anything relevant. I forget what it's in. It's probably an online course. <laughs> Maybe. he thought um he thought that moore's open question argument and the naturalistic fallacy were objecting to self-evident truths no it's not doing that <laughs> how would you get these misunderstandings like how would you ever think that about I, that I, even like a two minute like foray into the wikipedia article would debunk that yeah just like the like, the first paragraph is saying, you know, this is basically just Moore restating the Izzat gap. <laughs> but he said it's like, it's objecting to self-evident truths, like, good is good. And I was like, ah, that's, not, that's not even true at all. Like, I don't understand what you said. Because he got really upset when I said, um, like, his form of projectivism um, or his form of like moral realism would just be uh, like a naturalistic fallacy. I just because he he runs the meme <laughs> that uh, he basically equivocates on humane subjectivism of objectivism. Right? He says that um, objectivism comes about societies, as far as I understand it. He says something along the lines of like once multiple people believe in something it's objective because it's an objective fact of the matter about those people believing so well, that's, well, that's, that's not that's not subjective yeah that's, that's not that's, that's not just... but that's that's a subjective and b that would just be naturalistic fallacy because that would just be a descriptive fact about the opinions of those people it wouldn't be normative yeah and that like just to say something is intersubjective doesn't mean it's objective, right? Like, that's what I think about art. I think, you know, what makes art good is just this intersubjective thing, but that doesn't mean it's normatively the case that we should value Leonardo da Vinci's paintings or something. Right, exactly. It's just a descriptive fact that we will value intersubjectively this thing. Mm -hmm. Did you see his attempts to defend realism? Um, I think I, I, I found that debate I just find him really boring. I don't even think I watched the debate. Maybe I watched twenty minutes or something. It's a while. Right. If one person holds a moral value, it's subjective. If two hold it, it's subjective. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it, right? Oh, that's, that's so stupid. Right, and that's it's he's he's just making the intersubjective meme and naturalistic fallacy. It's just you know, such a joke. Yeah, that sounds sort of like um, John Stuart Mill's attempt to. Uh, prove like the objectivity of his moral oh, system is. he just said well everybody what he said is you know everybody desires happiness therefore happiness is good because it's desirable but, but it, it is know, well, that's that's, that's just where, a naturalistic fact that's that's where they get their arguments from they're all million they're all they're all continentals who just like sit around reading my stuff like that they've they've straight up told me that what, what they're getting their view from is mill yeah, well, Mill, Mill's argument is not, like, it's not accepted, because it's just obviously uh, right. jumping the Azor kind of. it, Yeah, it's one of the things that um, that Moore is objecting to, and I've told him that, that it's just a form of projectivism. Well, and then, he, and then he, tries to, he tries to rescue it with this whole, like, intuitionism meme, but I don't think he even understands intuitionism. 
yeah, I don't understand how this Cause, guy. Because like all I t- all I take intuition is to mean is just that it's an intuitive capability or faculty of human minds to perceive norms, much well, it's like just, yeah, it's much just like lo- much like much like logic or math, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It doesn't it doesn't make any ontological claims there's other ontological arguments and then all intuitionism is saying is how we epistemically come to know them but he thinks it's an actual like ontological thing and that intuitionism is the thesis and then he basically says it's like particularism but like full dancy particularism where it's just like there's not even um like contributory values it's just like things are yeah. particularly the case and we just intuit it you just see it yeah I mean, it's just insane like I don't even know how he could, how he could go about defending that just psychologically, like that seems to undermine like all concepts of like moral discussion. Like when we have moral discussions, we talk about the reasons why we think like killing is bad or why stealing is bad or why like you know things can be categorical or hypothetical. Like that there are reasons to things, but he thinks that intuitionism as a thesis is just basically particularism. <laughs> right. Yeah, he said. He said that's that's what I'm talking about. Asked. That's what Telephone. He thinks that we can just intuit a nameless trait, and basically all he means by nameless trait is just a form of particularism, where we just come to a conclusion, but we don't know the antecedent cause, or there might not even be an antecedent cause. Right, and the argument still works. I mean, you can say, well, what if I intuit a nameless trait that you know? It means that you don't have value. You can't tell you now. <laughs> right, exactly. Right, and so you could you could run like Isaac's objection to that view or Vic's objection to that view. <laughs> exactly, it's it doesn't actually grant you anything to say something like particularism. Yeah, these guys are so weird. Yeah, I gotta I gotta finish the video at some point, <laughs> but I've got just like so much else in my life it's sort of like increasingly just becoming like on the back burner. Yeah, I thought it was a very boring video. Right, it's not exactly right. Um, Shadow's just sort of, sort of one of those people that I have a, a tough time listening to because he openly admits that he's not even like very knowledgeable on this stuff. He's literally just Wikipedia warring us. Yeah, not even very well, apparently. Yeah. Not actually reading the articles. No, it was hilarious. Like, I was just laughing out loud the entire time he was describing, um, like, the, hist- <laughs> the history of the trait swap as a trait. It was just like, what, what does the, like, law of identity even have to do with this? Yeah, the, his whole... I mean, perspective philosophy's um, whole matter, I think, is just very... From what you're telling me now, that he's, like, kind of a particularist, apparently, but he's also... He's not really an objectivist, he's a intersubjectivist, but he's equivocating on that and making it sound like objectivism. That's all just very weird. Yeah, so, like, um, like Jack, Manny, and I tried to, like, go through, like, his debates once, because we were trying to bait Jack into debating him. <laughs> and, like, we went and watched his, like, JF performance. Um, we watched, like, his Vegan Gains performance. And, like, he just, he throws in so much jargon, and he just dodges so many questions. It's hard to nail down what he actually thinks meta-ethics, uh, about meta-ethics. But he, like, it's all he ever wants to talk about. But he's just so slippery on it that it's very unclear if he actually understands what he means when he says that he's a moral non-naturalist intuitionist. Because sometimes he, sometimes he talks about things like intersubjectively. Sometimes he talks about things um, like, in a, like a humane subjectivist form. Sometimes he na- hits the nail on the head with like humarian uh, intuitionism. Sometimes he's just like talking straight up about like moral naturalism. It's just like it's so whack all the time. And his view is that we need ethical realism and ethical non-naturalism to have discussions about <clears throat> like moral moral like we have to have moral discussions. And I, I know that you make that claim, but it's even weaker than you where he just doesn't even have an argument for that. 
Like he he thinks that like ethical arguments just can't work or like can't ever follow, but he's never provided an argument um, that like necessitates moral realism to show that like it leads to veganism or ne- like he hasn't ever shown an argument for moral realism being a necessary component for moral discussions even. He just sort of asserts these things. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it really irritates me when there's people who just want to be clear about what they believe. Like, why? Why does anybody do that? You know, you'd think that if you were having discussions about these kinds of topics, you just want to be clear about your opinion. Right. It always you know, throws me off when people are kind of slippery um, like that. Yeah, yeah probably, and probably it's, it's right sort of it. there's sort of two trademark things that I've noticed, like as I've just like talked to him recently. The first is he very quickly becomes patronizing, and so he's like very quick to like ask me if like I understand concepts or like what philosophers I've read, uh, or he'll appeal to PhDs very frequently. Um, mm. And the the second thing is you're right. He uses a lot of jargon. And he uses a lot of synonyms or a lot of like the same jargon in a single like discussion and so he'll he'll say like uh a meta ethical or like abstract ethical or like second order ethical like all in like the same (laughs) sentence and it's just like why are you doing this like why can't we just use meta ethical and just be done with it Mm, yeah i don't know um I don't really have much to say about this. I think this guy is just kind of an obvious moron. He doesn't really know what he's talking about. And, and he has a mark. Yeah, That's but, so baffling to me that he got this degree. But right, it's... it's it's I, I, I don't want to like come out and fully say that it was like... Like he didn't like get it in like almost anything relevant. If I remember correctly, it was like... um On like philosophy of art, right? And like on a specific, I think it was like on art critique or something like that. Right, but um, even if you're a master's, you'll you'll have got an undergraduate degree, and when you do your undergraduate degree, you'll go over you know the general things in philosophy, right? You talk about ethics, you talk about this. And right. So you should have some basic familiarity with all of these ideas. You would think so, right? But it's like they don't ever seem to have a firm grasp of logic. Or like a firm grasp of like any like contemporary philosophy. Yeah, well, that sounds it sounds very strange what you're talking about is master ethics, where he's doing this certification in that. Um, yeah, that's just very dishonest. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> the appeal to PhD has been my like favorite experience because. Like very very frequently, he'll like say like we've got Dave here and Dave's got a PhD. And what's hilarious is Dave is sort of a well known idiot as well. And so I have a lot of like arguments that like I've listened to against Dave. So I have like ten or so like go to like dumb things that like Dave has said. <laughs> so like whenever he tries to bring Dave in, I'll just like like bash Dave. And then say, well, yeah, it t- turns out the PhDs don't actually have value. And then just like continue on. What has he said? Um, Dave is like, for a lot of it, it's like economic stuff, but he's like a very like low level capitalist. Like, he doesn't have very strong objections to these things, but he also has like very naive views about like the analytic synthetic divide. He also has very naive views about free will. Like, he's a libertarian free will. And then um, he's basically a Kantian on like everything. So <laughs> he has very difficult time uh, like defending his views about categorical imperatives. Because it turns out right. Kant was not exactly right about a lot of things. Mm-hmm. But there's also just like, he'll just say something like along the lines of like, he'll do the, the curvy, like I have a master's degree in this and you can just be like, yeah, I have I have four I have four master's degrees, and then you just keep on you're like doing it. Yeah, that's pretty cringy if he's actually like needing to appeal to his degrees in conversation. Yeah. Um. Okay. Well, I guess we can see what happens with this. Uh, I got to do some stuff, and it's nice talking to. you. 
Yeah, I was talking to him. Yeah, that's all.